Well, let's continue to look today at how we can live more free in Christ because of all that he has done in, on our behalf, because of the reality of his presence in our life, the presence of the Spirit of God. And, uh, and so let's continue to look at this. And let's look at probably the area of greatest challenge for us in living free in Christ. And that would have to do with our personal sin. And not just our personal sin, but other people's personal sin. Why they do things to us or don't do things to us that they should. And why we don't do the things that we want to do, what we should do. And we often do things that are hurtful and destructive. Not a part of loving God and loving our neighbor as ourself. 1 John chapter 1 uh, these first few verses at the end of that chapter tell us about how uh, we live in this tension of, of the offer of full freedom from personal sin, and yet that sin reality will stay in our hearts until we take our final breath or the Lord Jesus returns and we are absolutely 100% fully glorified. Listen to 1 John chapter 1. This is the message we have heard from him, Jesus, and announced to you that God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and yet walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. And so we live in this tension where Jesus uh, through his life, his crucifixion, through his resurrection, has rendered all sin impotent in our hearts and lives. And yet, that is a, a reality, and we continue to act upon those sinful passions, and we continue to experience other people's sinful passions towards us. And I think uh, the best way to understand this is, is that there's to be a continual progressing or growth in greater freedom from any particular sin having control over us. Uh, this would be 2 Corinthians 3.18. That as we behold Christ in his word, we're transformed from one stage of glory to a greater stage of glory to a greater stage of glory. But we will be in the process, hopefully, of transformation and short of full perfection when we die or when the Lord returns. And so let me re-ask the three spiritual EKG questions that we looked at on Sunday. And let me just add some verses to them, because I think these are questions we need to continually ask ourselves to, to, to keep us on this path of transformation. First question is, is there any sin which uh, we continue to practice in an ongoing way. Is there any particular sin that just has a hold upon us? In Galatians chapter 5 is another one of those places where we see this great battle between our own flesh and what the Spirit can do in our lives. Galatians 5, beginning of verse 16. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. For the flesh sets its desire against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. For these are at opposition to one another, so that you may not do the things that you please. But if you're led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the deeds of the flesh are evident, which are immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmities, strife, jealousy, outburst of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envying, 
drunkenness, carousing, and things like these, of which I forewarn you, just as I have forewarned you, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. In other words, those are sins of the past, sins of our fallenness that continue to plague us. But if a person stays practicing those things, it would be an evidence that they are really not a Christian and the Spirit of God is present in their life. Because the fruit of the Spirit is love and joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and its desires. And so the way we move into greater freedom from any of these sins is that we crucify our flesh and we submit ourselves to the Spirit of God. And the great danger is that because the gospel is a gospel of grace based upon the finished person, finished work of Jesus Christ, the, the natural response, as Paul points out in Romans 6, 1, is, shall I continue in sin that grace may abound? Oh, God forbid! How can we who have died to sin continue any longer therein? When we put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ, we died to sin. And the Christian life is one of living out that death and continuing to crucify these particular passions, whether they're sexual passions or whether they're spiritual sorcery and idolatries or whether they're enmities and strife and jealousy with other people or outbursts of anger or disputes or dissensions or factions or drunkenness, carousing, any of those things. Is there any sin which just has a hold on you, which you continue to practice? God wants to set you free from that sin, which doesn't mean you won't have to continue to crucify it, but it means you can, you can have success in crucifying that and experiencing the fruits of the Spirit in place of the practice of that sin of love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and meekness and self-control. The second diagnostic question has to do with other people's personal sins against us. Is there any person with whom we are angry? There's just a bitterness. There's a seethingness. When we think of this person, we get angry. That means that we are not free. We are held captive by that person. That person is controlling us. And this is where forgiving other people is such a key part of the Christian life. And to forgive them, even as Christ has forgiven us. And to always remember Jesus has forgiven us much more then we will ever have to forgive anybody else. We have sinned against Christ much more than anybody has sinned against us. And so, is there a person, when I even say that, that pops into your head, is there a person, when you think of them, you just get angry and upset, and they actually control you? Jesus wants to set you free from that person, from that bitterness, from that sourness in your soul. Third question is, is there any circumstance that angers you, that you're fearful of, that you are avoiding? And this is kind of the same thing as the last one, only it has to do with impersonal circumstances probably as much as anything. And God, again, wants us to be free to walk into or towards any particular circumstance. Um, I gave the illustration on Sunday of parachuting and when we had one guy during my time that uh, his main chute did not open, his reserve opened at the last second right at treetop level and he landed and he was fine. But to not let that fear settle in and seethe 
we put him on the next plane, got him back to the airport, put him on the next plane, and he parachuted again within four or five hours because bad experiences create fears. And what we try to say to ourselves, give me enough time and I'll overcome it. No, time does not conquer fears. Pushing towards the experience, the same experience, and experiencing Christ in that experience is what helps us be free from the fear of anything. So is there any circumstance that angers you? Or is there any particular circumstance or situation that you avoid because of a really bad experience? God wants to set you free from that. He doesn't want you to live a limited life. He wants you to be free to follow him wherever he calls us. One of the most helpful things that I know of, and someone has discipled me in this, to help us embrace bad experiences with people, as well as circumstances, come with the commands at the end of 1 Thessalonians 5. Beginning in verse 15, See that no one repairs another evil for evil, but always seek after that which is good for one another and for all people. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. In everything give thanks, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Do not quench the Spirit. Do not ex despise prophetic utterances, but examine everything carefully. Hold fast to that which is good. As abstain from every form of evil. Those are a list of commands that I believe if we will obey those commands, we will continually grow more and more to live in the freedom that Christ calls us to. May you experience more of the freedom in Christ today than you ever have before. And may you do it as a part of the celebration of his coming. Jesus came to set us free. And if he set us free, we are free indeed. God bless you.